Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today, today's Census Startup Seminar. Our topic today is service in the Australian Defence Force, which is a new question on the Census in 2021. I'm joining you today from the lands of the Turrbal people in Brisbane. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet, extending that acknowledgement across all the lands we are broadcasting to today. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining this event today. Given the topic of this seminar, I would also like to acknowledge our current service people and those who have served for our country. My name is Emily Casey, and I work in the Census Dissemination Team at the Australian Bureau of Statistics. I will be joined today by my colleague Cass Elliott, Assistant Director in the Disability, Carers and Veterans Statistics section, will help me share some of the insights the 2021 census data was able to provide on people who have served in the Australian Defence Force. Later, we will be joined by an expert panel, which includes Air Commodore Karen Coy, acting head of the People Capability in the Defence People Group at the Department of Defence, Colonel Peter Whiteman, RFD, Manager Defence Census Workforce Planning Branch at the Department of Defence, Alison Hale, Assistant Secretary of the Community Policy Branch at the Department of Veterans Affairs, and Caitlin D. Getbari, Unit Head of the Veterans Insights and Projects Unit at the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. During the session today, we'll have time to answer your questions. So if you go to pollev.com forward slash 2021 census SADF, that's Service Australian Defence Force, on your computer or on your mobile device, you can submit your questions at any time. After we've shared some data with you, I'll be back to put these questions to our panel members. So in the 2021 census, a new question was asked of all people aged 15 years and over. It simply asked if the person had ever served in the Australian Defence Force and gave options to indicate whether that was with the regular service or the reserves and whether the person was still currently serving or had previously served. The process to add a topic to the census is rigorous and ultimately a decision for the Australian government. Two new questions were added to the 2021 census, which was the first time questions had been added since 2006. The other new question was about long-term health conditions. This process started with a public consultation where we heard from many data users that including a question on Defence Force service would be very valuable to help better understand this population and the pathways people who have left ADF service take, including employment, education and health outcomes. The value of asking questions on the census is that it includes everyone in Australia on census night and allows us to do analysis with other questions covered on the census. And we can release that data at small geographical areas. So pictured here is a summary of the topics covered in the census and the data we have released so far. By asking about service with the ADF on the census, it's possible to analyze the current and previous serving populations with any of these variables. For example, in June, we released an article that looked at the age and sex profiles of service personnel, the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who had served, what parts of Australia they lived in, what long-term health conditions they had, and whether they had volunteered. We recently added to this with an analysis of educational qualifications, labor force status, and whether they had moved in the years prior to the census. Earlier this week, we released an additional article focusing on people who had previously served in the ADF. Today, we will hear from our panelists how, using the census, how they use census data to inform the understanding of this population. This information can then be used in the development of policy and delivery of services. So census information is freely available on the ABS website and you can explore what interests you. For example, you may be interested in the number of people who have served in your local government area or region. On the screen is some of the easiest ways to access census data on our website. If you search census data by topic, you'll find a page that summarizes service with the Australian Defence Force and links to our two articles. You can use the search census data function to access pre-packaged products like quick stats and community profiles which delivers statistics for specific areas. Uh, products like Table Builder and Data Packs are available for more advanced users to further explore the data. So 
So all the ways to access data can be found on our website and you can also pay to request a customized data via the information consultancy service. So we'll now look at the population and demographics identified in the 2021 census for those who served in the Australian Defence Force. So it's important to look at the different definitions we have around service. When we talk about service in this presentation, this includes both regular and reserve service, where regular service is the primary job of the individual and reserve service is more part-time. Our ever served population includes both current or previous regular or reserve service in the Australian Defence Force. This includes the Royal Australian Navy, Australian Army, Royal Australian Air Force, Second Australian Imperial Force, National Service, and the Northwest Mobile Force. Over 581,000 people have served in the ADF, making up 2.8% of the population aged over 15 years. Currently serving members, as the name suggests, is anyone currently serving in the regular or reserved service, regardless of their previous service. This includes approximately 85,000 people with the largest demographic group aged between 25 and 29 years of age. Our previously served group includes anyone who served in either the regular or reserve service and who is not currently serving. This includes around 496,000 people. The census data shows that more than one quarter of former serving members are between 65 and 74 years of age. This group of nearly 130,000 Australians represents the cohort resulting from the scheme of selective conscription in Australia under the National Service Act in 1964. So on this slide, you can see the breakdown of the ever served population, highlighting that the majority sit in the previously served group. Of those who had served in the ADF, the 2021 census showed 10.4% were currently serving in the regular service, 4.2% were currently serving in the reserves, and 85.4% had previously served in either the reserve or regular service and were not currently serving. So in this graph, we can see the age profile of the current service and previous service groups. We can see that currently serving ADF members had a much younger age profile with over half aged under 35 years. The average age for those in regular service was 34 years and for reserves, it was 41 years. Those who previously served in the ADF were more likely to be older with over half aged 65 years or more and an average age of 64 years. So you can see that there's this spike in the 70 to 74 age group, and that's around 82,000 people. Uh, as we talked about earlier, that is likely due to the conscription scheme of 1964. In this slide, we can see the state or territory of usual residence for those who were currently or had previously served against the never served population. This is people who had never served in the Australian Defence Force. You can see Queensland had the highest number of previous service members, approximately 30% of the group, and New South Wales had the highest number of currently serving members. Just over half of previous service members lived in a greater capital city, with 45% living in a regional area. So following on, this table shows that the top regions, previous service members, were living in on the night of the 2021 census. The areas listed are largely regional, which is consistent with the general community. So movement out of capital cities to the regions is more likely in as people get older. Also bases can be found in many of those lo these locations and may contribute to high numbers of previous service members living in these areas. So I'd now like to hand over to Cass Elliott, who will start by looking at some edu educational outcomes. Thank you, Cass. Thank you, Emily. Um, the next part of the presentation is really focused on people who've previously served in the Australian Defence Force, looking at education, employment and health status at the time of the census last year in 2021. So the census does provide us with a wide range of information about the population of those people who served in the ADF. But I'd also like to um, note that it doesn't directly link people's service um, to their to their education, employment or health health outcomes. The statistics present a snapshot at a moment in time 
rather than an individual pathway of people who have served. And the panel that's here today can provide some more context around how to interpret this data um, in the discussion later. So let's have a look at people's educational outcome. So uh, post-school post education um, qualifications are more likely to um, result in employment outcome, better outcomes for people than those with lower educational attainment. So while people do achieve their education across their lives, we've focused this data on people aged 25 to 64 to allow them to have time to be able to achieve that outcome. So people who are previous service members aged 25 to 64 were more likely to hold certificates, one, two, three or four, as their highest level of education compared to those who never served. They're less likely to have a bachelor's degree as their highest qualification than those that had never served. And they're more likely to have a graduate certificate or graduate diploma as their highest level of education compared to those who never served. Um, you also note on this graph that people, previous reservists have the highest levels of education with one in five previous reserve service members having bachelor's degree compared to one in eight previous regular service members. Um, as a total population, the previous service members aged 25 to 64 are less likely to have obtained a bachelor's degree or above than those who'd never served. However, total reserve service members were as likely as people who've never served to obtain a bachelor's degree or, and higher. Females who'd previously served were more likely than males as well to have obtained a bachelor's degree, so one in three compared to almost one quarter. Um, females who had previously served in reserves were, um, were more likely to have obtained a bachelor's degree as well compared to females who had previously served in regular service and those who, females who had never served. In terms of the field of study that people achieved their qualifications in, um, people who, who had previously served were more likely to have a qualification in engineering and related technology, so almost just around a quarter of people compared to 14% of the general population. And they're less likely to have a qualification in management or commerce than those who had never served. Interestingly, they're also slightly more likely to have a qualification in society and culture. Um, next, we're gonna look at employment for people who previously served. Um, there were 174,300 previous service members aged 15 to 64 who were engaged in employment the night of the census. Uh, this is a, it's a similar proportion when we compare people who previously served to those who had never served that were employed. But what we did note was that people who had previously served were more likely to be working full-time compared to people um, and less likely to be working part-time compared to those people who'd never served. 45% uh, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who had previously served worked full-time compared to 29% of people in the same population who had never served. And 5% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who had previously served were unemployed compared to 8% of people who'd never served. When we look at the occupation um, at a broad level, the most common occupations for people who previously served were um, professionals, so 22%, managers, 17.3%, and technic technicians and trade workers. Uh, those who previously served were more likely to be machinery operating occupations than those who had never served. However, they were half as likely to be in a sales working occupation compared to those who'd never served. Previous regular service members were more likely to be technicians and trade workers compared to reserve service members. Looking at um, health now. So there are different health outcomes between people who had served compared to those who'd never served. The previously served population has an average age of 64 years, as Emily mentioned, compared to 46 years of people who'd never served. And some of the findings that I'm presenting in this section should be considered in that context that it is an, an aging population. Uh, 
Um, as Emily mentioned, this 2021 census was the first time that we collected long-term health conditions data for people. Um, among people who'd previously served, three in five had a long-term health condition. And those who'd previously served in regular service were more likely to, um, to report having a long-term health condition than those who'd previously only served in reserves, regardless of the age. Previous regular service um, had higher rates of arthritis and mental health. Um, as you can see on this slide, previous reserves um, also had higher levels of heart disease. Regular service were more likely to compare a mental health condition, which was 18%, compared to those people who'd been in reserve who reported 10% reported um, mental health condition. You'll note that the asthma bars are a little bit lower for people who have served, and that reflects a change in eligibility um, requirements for the ADF, which in prior to 2007 prevented uh, people with a history of asthma from entering the service. Um, finally, we're going to look at um, need for assistance with core activities. So, uh, this graph shows people 15 years and over um, with a profound or severe activity limitation. People with a profound or severe activity limitation are those needing assistance in their day-to-day -day lives in one or more of three core activity areas of self-care, mobility and communication. And this is due to either a long-term condition, a disability or age when we talk about self-care activities, we're referring to the need for assistance with showering, eating, dressing, or toileting. And when we talk about body movement, assistance getting out of bed, moving around the home, or moving around places away from home. And in terms of communication, this is assistance with being understood um, or understanding from others. Given the older age of this previously served population, uh, this graph gives us a bit more of a breakdown around our need for assistance by age groups. So across all the age groups presented, people who previously served in regular service were more likely to have a core need for assistance than those who had not served. People aged 15 to 44 who had served were almost twice as likely to have a core need for assistance compared to those who had never served. People aged 45 to 64 um, who had previously served in regular service were 1.8 times more likely to have a core need for assistance than people of the same age who'd never served. And we can see a really similar pattern, although um, ageing is obviously a factor there for 65 years and over. Oh, I apologise, my light has gone off and I need to wave my arms to make it happen. Sorry, excuse me for one second. Okay, so just in conclusion um, to that analysis, um, this is really just the tip of the iceberg of what you can do with census data. Um, and we know that there's a lot more interesting um, information that people will use this for. In addition to the census, the ABS holds other data about this population. Um, and provides more detailed breakdowns around health, mental health and disability. And we encourage you to explore the free data that's available on the ABS website. I'll now hand back to Emily. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Cass. It's the joys of um, digital living, isn't it? Having lights and things go off in the background. Um, thank you so much for that. It is now my pleasure to welcome and introduce our panel to you for today. Uh, we've been able to gather some government experts related to service with the Australian Defence Force, and we would like to thank them for dialing in. Please welcome Air Commander Karen Coy, Colonel Peter Whiteman, RFD, Alison Hale, and Caitlin D. Getbari. And we will also have Cass Elliott available to answer questions. So firstly, uh, we will give each panellist an opportunity to introduce themselves, and if there's anything they would like to promote in their areas around this topic. And we'll start with Karen. Welcome, Karen. Thanks so much, Emily. So my name's Air Commodore Karen Coy, uh, Karen for the purpose of, of, of today. 
Um, my role this week, whilst my boss is away, is acting head of people capability, which means that I have accountability for the workforce planning area, the recruitment and the transition for those uh, within the ADF and also greater defence of included, inclusive of APS. In my normal role, I am the Director Gen General for Joint Transition Authority, which means I have accountability for those that are transitioning out of the ADF into a predominantly civilian life. So this data is of a great deal of interest for us and um, I look forward to your questions. Fantastic, thanks Karen. I'll hand over to Peter next. Uh, hello, I'm Colonel Peter Whiteman and I am the manager of the Defence Census so, and Workforce Planning Branch. And uh, the Defence conducts its own census of the ADF workforce every four years and we collect a wide range of socioeconomic data that's not readily available in our administrative holdings and it aligns a lot with the ABS population census. So this data is important, um, providing a comparison of, of our internal data and also comparing that against the ex-serving and the civilian population to see um, how we reflect and compare. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, Alison? Thanks. Uh, Alison Hale, Assistant Secretary of the Community Policy Branch in the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, and I have responsibility for a range of policy areas, which include veteran employment um, rehabilitation, which is about getting veterans back into work, um, uh, transition policy and research. So those kind of all those hot topics, the, the stuff in this, the census work has been a really exciting time for us in terms of what we can use this data for. There's a lot of there's a lot of, been a lot of um, commentary over the years around veteran employment or unemployment rates, unemployment rates, and it's really great to actually now have some data that we can use to think where we need to target our policies and programs. Thank you. Thanks, Alison. And Caitlin. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name's Caitlin Sigafari, and I am the unit head of the Veterans Insights and Projects team at the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. Um, the work program or the veterans work program at um, AIHW actually straddles two teams. Um, it includes mine, which is Veterans Insights and Projects Unit, but it also includes the Defence and Veterans Suicide Monitoring Unit. Um, as part of a strategic partnership with the Department of Veteran Affairs, um, both units are striving to build a profile and stronger source of evidence to inform the health and wealth being of Australian veterans and their families. Um, we do this through an extensive work program involving both data linkage, um, involving census data, um, as discussed today, and also uh, a strong analysis of uh, various household surveys, including many that the ABS release. Um, our body of work uh, speaks to the heart and vision of the AHW, um, and we endeavour to take a coordinated whole of veteran population approach to monitoring and reporting on current status and future needs of veterans and their families. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll go back to Alison for this next question. How does your organisation use or intend to use this census information? And what questions have you been able to answer or do you plan to investigate for the first time? Thanks, struggling to get myself off mute. It wouldn't be uh, <laughs> virtual if that wasn't happening. Um, thanks for the question. Look. I think, I think for us, there's been, a, as I said in my opening, there's been a lot of media reporting and um, commentary over the years about how difficult it is veterans uh, find to find employment. And, you know, I, it is certainly the case of COVID and get up a veteran policy team for exactly that reason. But I think um, the really interesting thing around the data is it confirms that the majority, the majority of veterans actually transition well they find employment. There is a cohort that struggle as they transition. I think what this data tells us is tells us the characteristics of that cohort to think, okay, where, as opposed to thinking having, say, a veteran employment program that is, uh, you know, an inch thin and a mile wide, where are the cohorts that are struggling most? What are their characteristics and how do we target policies and programs to help them? So that's, and the granularity of both the health characteristics and location. Um, there's more work we all want to do about, you know, their 
defence service that might inform a little bit better targeting. But I think this is a fantastic first step and I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about it. Thank you. We might ask the same question of Peter. So how does your organisation intend to use this information and what questions are you planning to investigate for the first time? Yeah, the, uh, the data, we concentrate mainly on the serving population and there's a lot of alignment in the data and results that the ABS has produced for both the permanent and reserve cohorts. And that enables us um, to look at, you know, benchmarking uh, our ADF workforce against the attributes of the ex-serving and also the civilian populations, particularly around um, occupation details, um, location. There's a lot of posting. People move around a lot in the ADF and we can just see, compare that into the civilian world and see how much that is different. Look at the types of houses, um, housing circumstances people uh, are living in and is, is the ADF matching, keeping pace with that? And I think a really important area is um, families of ADF partners. So we have a number of research activities that look into that. We have a research family research program, but the census data will provide that information. We'll be able to unpack for serving members about their household family situation, where they are, what their partner's employed with, what their childcare is. And I think that's, that's gonna be a real insight for us. Thank you. Great, thanks. And Karen, did you have anything else to add to Peter's answer on that? Um, Peter's area is very strong in the research side. So on the other side is more the practical uh, use of the data that's in the census. So we not only do we use it as a benchmark for some of our health research, for example, your the census data identified arthritis and mental health our top two lead topics of research in the health area are around the musculoskeletal and, the, and mental health. So that helped to validate that we were looking in the right direction. But more, more to the point, we, do, we use the data for things like recruiting. We know those who are ex-serving and have contact with uh, the, the greater the ex-serving population is the areas where there are a greater propensity to serve. So it gives us uh, locations and means and uh, mechanisms to advertise and uh, undertake re recruiting programs. So if you can see the demographics, the, the, now, the current demographic data will actually help us to target those recruiting programs a little bit better. Um, we, we do do our own recruiting propensity research, so it does help to validate some of that work. We also use it in the transition space. A really, really good example is uh, there was an election commitment for a, uh, what they're calling an op navigator. It's a career planning or the Looks like you might've had a dropout there. I will pass to Caitlin, and I know the tech people will work some magic in the background. So, Caitlin, did you want to address that question? Yeah, thanks very much, Emily. Um, like we have done with the 2016 census, uh, the AHW and in particular my team um, intends to link defence administration data with the 2021 census information uh, within the MADAP environment that's housed at the ABS. Um, this will enable more detailed analysis of the veteran population and, the fam and their families um, to be undertaken. In particular, it allows us to, um, as Alison mentioned, the census gives a high level overview and by able to break um, that down into further layers using service characteristics, um, we can better understand those um, transition pathways of um, members who have uh, separated from the ADF. Uh, we are also keen to explore those who have served and who actually didn't identify as having had served in the census. These insights will help us um, to understand the population who actually do but do not recognise as having had served. Um, and an extension to this, this will help us to 
um, perhaps uh, understand some of the characteristics of those who have served but who are non-DBA clients. So there's a few layers in that that we um, hope to explore. Uh, also through our data linkage program, um, we'll be using the 2021 census along with the 2011 and 2016 censuses um, to explore changes over time in uh, well-being characteristics that the ABS, uh, sorry, that the census allows us to explore, such as many topics that have been discussed today, like employment, education, um, housing circumstances, and income. Um, uh, this is essentially uh, an extension to the wellbeing report that my team released on the 1st of September. Thank you. And I'll just hand over to Alison um, with some additional commentary. Thanks, Emily. And I, I know this is not the kind of forum where you put a hand up, but I thought I'd have a go. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Karen um, prompted me on something uh, when she mentioned election commitments. So um, there was an election commitment during the campaign um, by the Labor Party, which, of course, the government has been, has um, uh, approved in the recent budget, which is a $24 million veteran employment program, um, which builds on existing initiatives. But I think the really interesting thing about that is there's a key component of that is a communications campaign. Um, and what this report does for us is go, OK, we can point to something that says actually business X um, you may have heard the media beat up that veterans are, you know, can't find employment or have difficulties. Look at this evidence that says actually, they, you know, they do well, they earn well, etc. Um, and it allows us to go, okay, where do we need to target our messages to tell this good news story and and share this information? So I think that's a really, it's a soon and tangible use that we'll have of this data. Thanks, Alison. Um, I did just want to check in with Karen very quickly. Was there anything else you'd like to add to your answer or I can move on to the next question? Let's move on to the next one, Emily. I'm sure Great. I'll get another chance. <laughs> Definitely. Plenty of opportunities. Uh, so the next question, uh, we might start with Caitlin. Uh, were there any findings that were surprising or unexpected for you or are they consistent with your experience and what you already know about this population. So if there's any real life context, we're really looking for that if you have any. Yeah, thanks, Emily. So the 2021 census data um, on ADF service gives us an opportunity, um, and it's been mentioned before from the other panelists, but it gives us an opportunity to validate uh, findings that we've explored in other data sources like the ABS's um, National Health Survey um, and the recently released National Survey of Mental Health and Wellbeing. Um, as well as insights from our data linkage program. So it is wonderful to have so many rich data sources uh, to build a profile of um, uh, ex-serving members or um, and, and their families. Um, the findings from the 2021 um, census that were also discussed today um, are consistent with our analysis of uh, ex-serving um, ADF cohort. Um, and the wellbeing outcomes measured in the 2016 census. So things like that were discussed this morning, like the proportion of males to females, the age profile, the um, dominant living location being Queensland, strong employment, um, the profile of occupations, owning their own home, um, either outright or with a mortgage, and um, educational attainment. They are all um, consistent with the insights that we found through our data linkage program to the 2016 census. Um, for us, the um, not so much a surprise, but essentially the census um, 2021 data allowed us to get an understanding of a total population of those who have served and currently served. Um, this was somewhat lower than estimates we had previously been working with. Um, but we just need to acknowledge that we were previously working with um, an estimate, but also um, as great as the census is, it only captures those living in Australia um, and at home on census night. Um, and so anyone um, visiting overseas um, may not have been captured in that. So, um, yeah, I suppose the total count may have been um, a, a touch to surprise relating to your, your question, but overall, the findings um, in especially across the wellbeing domains were extremely consistent with the um, survey analysis that we do, but also um, our linkage analysis to the 2016 census. 
Thanks so much, Caitlin. Uh, we might see if Peter had anything else to add to that question. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, as I said before, the data was confirmatory. You, you did mention in there uh, one of your slides about the median age of the, the serving population between the reserve and, and the permanent regular. And I probably should just explain that to people like it showed that the reserve median was um, something like 41 years compared to the regular 34. And the, the reason for that is because the uh, Navy and Air Force Reserve comprises people that have previously served in the permanent um, regular force. So they've done their five years or 10 years or 20 years or whatever, and then they've transitioned into the reserve and continued on. So that actually means that they are, because they've already had service, they're older. Whereas the Army Reserve has both models of people who come out of the regular Army and continue serving in the reserve, and also those that can join as a recruit and uh, progress through as a parallel career like myself um, and have a reserve career and a civilian career there. So that actually comes together to show that the reserve is actually uh, has an older age group, but it doesn't mean that's just because um, we've recruited older people. It's because we've actually got a more experienced body of people in the reserve. So, so that's one thing that people would look at that and say, well, why does that happen there? Um, also, in, in the findings, I, I think it does show, I, I read an article that someone had, had wrote um, a couple of weeks ago comparing this data. It did show that if you're, if you're serving, you possibly got a higher income, you move more, and you're um, uh, also um, healthier until you get out, um, and then you're not as healthy. Um, so that's, that's interesting as, as well there. But on the whole... Um, from what we're seeing in the research side, it's good comparative data for us and it'll be a great benchmark going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. We'll just check in with Karen to see if she had anything else to say about those findings. I just thought I might put forward a possible explanation for what Caitlin was saying in terms of the numbers being a little bit lower for reservists. We have to remember that the people who completed the census, uh, census data were doing it on their, on their own. They were doing it for themselves. Our data is uh, that AIHW would have used is based on our systems. In 2006, I think it was around 2006, uh, Defence made a determination that every member who joined after a certain date would automatically enter an element of the reserves upon the cessation of their full-time period of service, so that when they left the permanent service. So what you may find is that our data might have them identified as a reservist, even though they don't actually actively undertake any reserve duties. So it is. Uh, so a person may not actually realise that they are identified as a reservist because they're not doing any work. I'm not sure if I've explained that very well, but we have a period of five years post a person's permanent career where they are nominally on our systems as a reservist, but they may not actually be undertaking full-time duties. It just might provide some explanation for that difference in, in what the count is. Uh, the other thing that I thought I would give you is a practical ex example. We always thought about 40%, maybe 50% of our people uh, relocated on transition to another location. Your census data pretty much backed that up when they uh, identified the locations of all of our uh, personnel who were former servants. So I just thought I'd say... It's not different, it is as we expected, but it helps to validate that for us. Thanks so much. I think that did shed a lot of light on that. I will just uh, also throw the question to Alison to see if there's anything else she would like to add to that. Thanks very much. I think like the other panellists, there's nothing surprising. It's confirming what we had started to see through you know, other data sources, data sources, other reports. I think what this has really given us too, though, is um, I've been part of the Five Eyes research working group on and off over many years, and for many years all countries were trying to get a question in the census. Some have got, got one 
some haven't. But this sharing this research with other countries, it's really interesting to see where some countries are very similar and some countries are not, and to actually have this not just an anecdotal but an actual solid sense-based piece of data is really, really useful for those conversations to understand where are differences, what are the policy or program or general community settings that might mean that's the case. Um, you know, generally Australia is doing quite well compared to other countries. Great. And then while I have you, Alison, I might ask an additional question, which I'll also ask to all the panellists. Uh, what does having this data available mean for your organisation and to people who are currently serving or have previously served? So I'll just try that again. Sorry, I think we might have had a glitch there. Um, I might throw to Karen, actually. What does having this data available mean for your organisation and to people who are currently serving or have previously served? So for the people who are actually serving, it doesn't actually have any direct impact on them as individuals. What it might do, though, is redirect our services and our support to the areas that need it most. Uh, but like I was saying to you before, it actually acts as the benchmark against our own research, against uh, the serving population. So when we do all the um, analytics and the research into health conditions and things like that, we don't generally have, an, we don't always have an Australian benchmark or an Australian norm, and this will provide us that for when we do that research. Thanks. And Peter, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, <clears throat> not really. Like that's that's pretty much in, in a nutshell for us. But some of the topics that we will be comparing is uh, occupation data and looking at the employment value proposition. So um, how does that compare? How does our workforce compare to the work, to the workforce that existed at census night? And we know that's just come out of post-COVID and the workforce has changed a lot. It's easier for me to get a car park these days because not as many people come to work. Um, so that's where some of the research will, will, for us will be heading. And as I said before, in the family space, I think the, the data is going to be very powerful. That's a bit of a missing link. But we've had a number of research projects and we'll be able to link all those in, as um, the Air Commodore was saying. Thank you. Thank you. And I might just touch base with Alison to see if you wanted to answer this question. What does having this data available mean for your organisation and to people who are currently serving or have previously served? Thanks. Um, look, I think it's more of the same in terms of what it's allowing us to do. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of what it means for those who've served or currently served, I think there's been a really keen interest um, from the veteran community to, to get more data about their service and to also kind of have it. I think the challenge we face in, in, in my space in terms of veteran employment is that narrative that has been out there in terms of veterans being, uh, uh, you know, unemployed. Um, and this gives us this, the information that perhaps that, that's the case. But to be able to give veterans the, you know, the into that negative narrative that, you know, perhaps if not feeling you've got the skills to have it out there that you don't have to pull against because we can put the positive message out there. So for, for um, uh, it, all, it, it allows us to help with this. And also, as Peter said, it gives us a great baseline, um, you know, as I'm sure a number of people are aware in the midst of a Royal Commission of Defence and Veteran Suicide, there's a range of things the government's doing as recommendations come out. So if the, as we change our policy and program settings, what does that mean around health and wellbeing and employment. So it's a really important time. It would be great if we'd had this data 10, 15 years ago that, you know, we take, we've got a question the census, where can we build on from here? What, where can we drill down to understand more going forward? So I think it's, it's an evolving space um, that will just allow us to fine tune and find new, new areas of need. Thanks, Alison. I'm just, 
getting a little pop up. There we go. Um, I did have another question that I might start with Caitlin. Um, we had a comment come in. It is interesting that there are differences in the stats between regular service and reserve service across all topics you covered today. For example, education, employment, and health conditions. I would be interested if the panel could provide some insights into why you think this might be. What do you think there is such a difference? Why do you think there is such a difference between these cohorts? Yeah, thanks for that. I must admit, um, I might also give an opportunity for um, uh, uh, Peter or um, Karen to have a, have a discussion because our research to date has focused on the ex-serving um, population and not so much on the serving and reserves. We are certainly um, uh, looking forward to exploring um, that data, not only through linkage, but also um, through the outcomes of the 2021 census. Um, from a quick response to that question from uh, our um, data analysis would be um, the, the profile. So. Um, we've already touched on that the age profile um, is somewhat different between those who are serving and those um, in the reserves. Um, and also um, the, the experience that that age is then would be um, related to other experience and, and outcomes, um, which we've seen in um, linkage work, but happy for other panellists to, to add to that. I'm happy to say a couple of words, Emily. So with the three services and the reserve constructs, they're all quite quite different, as Peter was suggesting. Uh, with the Army Reserve, they are recruited uh, predominantly direct entry. And over the years, so I'm, I just want to clarify, I think that this is reserve service at any point in time. So the reserve standard recruitment standards have evolved over time as well. So generally our Army Reserve, which form the bulk of our reservists by a long way, have had a, uh, therefore the, the general entry, what we call general entry, so they are the unskilled workers are often at the, uh, at the general entry reserve, Army Reserve. And they are the bulk of the numbers by far. The Air Force and Navy Reserves, and, and you'd have to do a little bit more research to see if the type of reserve employment had, um, had some relationship with the demographic profile that was identified for the housing. I, sex, I suspect there would be a relationship. The other aspect is Navy and Air Force only have a very small reserve force relative to Army and their age demographic and education demographic is, as Peter was saying, generally ex-permanent and higher income or higher, higher employment type status. But they are only a small portion of the overall reserve force. So you have to look at the numbers break the numbers down by almost by the method of entry to get some more fidelity around answering that question. The method and service of entry would need to be looking to, to answer that appropriately. Would any other panellists like to comment on that question? I will move on if not. Um, I had one for Alison. How is this data assisting in shaping DVA policies, particularly considering the increasing number of younger, so the millennial Gen X veterans? I think you're just on mute, Alison. Someone had to say it. <laughs> I think that I think that thing I got off mute then, didn't I? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, I, I think in terms of the younger cohort, I think the nature of work has changed a lot uh, for Australia, not just for veterans, obviously. Um, and we're seeing a, a, a structural shift towards higher skilled jobs. Um, and there's changes in technologies that mean job functions are changing. So I think the interesting thing around this data is it starts to give us a 
better understanding of the qualifications that people have and that, you know, that we are understanding that to stay employed in the workforce, you need, you know, maybe one, more than one qualification. So to understand what is the baseline of both current serving and veterans uh, and, you know, they are, as a general, they have got a higher level of qualification, but is it in the right field? Um, one of the other things that was part of the, the bud, recent budget announcement was some work around recognition of prior learning. Um, and what does that mean? There's a very strong program within defence that exists. Um, and defence obviously has a very a high interest in recognising that skills that serving members have developed throughout their career are recognised and can be recognised in the civilian workforce but understanding the qualifications of those who have recently transitioned to inform what, how we can support them into civilian workforce and translate those skills, I think is really important. And this gives us some of that information. Fantastic, thank you. I think that we have a similar question, uh, which we might start with Peter. Um, oh, sorry, Karen might be more appropriate. How will this demographic data be used to shape ADF policies, ADF policies to support retention of current members? So I, I guess thinking about it, we know where people want to live. So it's uh, impacting on our flexible working arrangements and those policies and procedures around there. It's also... Um, we're looking at things like to support partners of those that want. So, for example, we can see the southeast Queensland area is an area that a lot of serving members want to be. So, we're looking at ways to support partner employment, particularly in the southeast Queensland area. So, they're just some practical examples. I guess it, it's not the census data itself that is going to shape policies, it validates the policies that we are developing to try and increase retention. So it's for further data to, to back up what we kind of already know that we need to do. And I'm just giving you a heads up. It's telling me my internet connection is unstable. So we'll see how we go. No problem. We might uh, go to Peter just to see if there was anything else he'd like to add to that. Yep. Um, turn yeah, okay. Um, just confused there. It showed me on mute, but I actually am <laughs> live. Uh, we use census data and we've used it um, over the years. It's very powerful data to uh, look at the services that government provides around our bases. So like access to childcare facilities and amenities within and around defence bases. So the census data is very important to that. So we can make a case that, you know, we've got X number of thousand young males in a particular place and need more um, sporting facilities, et cetera. Or um, we have a lot of uh, young families with um, children uh, below school age and therefore there will be, there's demand um, for more childcare and ascent and and also um, for housing as well, uh, the data is, is used for that. So especially um, when we're planning um, expansion or moving of defence assets, the, um, and the census data helps, as um, Air Commodore Coy was saying, it helps support the policy decision. It's not actually making decisions, but it's the actual evidence base that we can say, if we did this, um, who's the people affected and how are they um, positively affected or not. Thank you. And did you have something to add to that, Karen? I just thought I'd take the opportunity because Peter reminded me. Um, we have a number of programs in schools and in the childcare centres where we support uh, childcare centres and childcare centre placements, and we have uh, mentors within schools in certain areas. We do that based off data like the census data. We work out where the defence children are at school or where their childcare requirements are. And we enter into arrangements with schools and different, uh, different childcare centres to create um, increased availability or support for defence families. So again, it's, it's just one of the things that 
one of the many things that we do to try and support our people as we move them around the country. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I think we only have time for one more question. Uh, I will just ask it. I'll start with um, Alison, but welcome the panel to jump in if they have um, anything to comment. Is there any data that's captured on culture and language diversity within the Australian Defence Force? So I think this uh, in regards to either previous or current. Sorry, that completely dropped. This one I'll leave with the leader as well. Peter to answer it. Yeah, I think Peter can jump in. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Uh, got some message there. Um, so the answer to that is yes, we capture a lot of data on diversity and culture within um, the ADF, and we capture it through our administrative system. We capture it through uh, quarterly surveys of um, the You'll Say survey that we run of our workplace, and we also capture it in the Defence Census which uh, was previously run in 2019, and I'm doing the planning now for the 2023 Defence Census. So uh, we have a dashboard on, on culture. We're very interested in changes in diversity. Uh, we know that diverse teams outperform um, the um, monoculture team. And um, so uh, it's, a, it's well and truly uh, looked at, um, and we target uh, the way we um, focus uh, the way we work and um, to be a more attractive employer as well to a diverse workforce. So um, got lots of information on that. Um, it shows, uh, like we show we're increasing in, um, I think we've uh, increased our number of um, people in the ADF who speak Hindi. That's been a bit of a change in recent years, which um, corresponds to an increase in people from the Indian subcontinent we're actually migrating to Australia. So um, that's actually starting to show up in our diversity area. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. I'll just uh, touch base with um, the rest of the panel if anyone would like to comment on any uh, culture or language diversity information that they collect in regards to people who have served or currently serving. Excellent, I think Peter might've hit the nail on the head there. Fantastic. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. I want to say a big thank you again to our excellent panel, Alison, Caitlin, Kyron, Peter, and Cass as well for presenting earlier today. Uh, thank you for giving your time. I think we've heard some great insights and I'm excited about what this data can do in the future. Uh, if your questions were not answered today, you can email them to clientservices at abs.gov.au and we will direct your questions to our panel members uh, where appropriate. You can also visit the ABS website and explore the data available from the 2021 census, including previous seminars and articles that explore this topic and many others. A recording of today's session will be made available in the coming days on the ABS website and the ABS YouTube channel. Thank you again to our presenters and panel members today for your time and expertise and all of the people who made this seminar possible. Uh, and thank you to our viewers for asking questions and tuning in.